Item number SCP-6690 Object Class Keta Special Containment Procedures Actors who are currently or have historically been the target of the SCP-6690 phenomenon are to be placed under extensive protective detail. Foundation operatives are to respond to all emergency calls determined to have been caused by SCP-6990. Foundation security has been implanted into the Barney and Friends set under the guise of actors portraying Baby Bob, BJ, and Riff, all of whom are closely acquainted with the Barney the Purple Dinosaur character. Foundation engineers are to inspect the set of Barney and Friends monthly for signs of tampering or degradation. Any signs of potential Danger or anomalous connection are to be reported directly to the site security detail and the site head administrator. Description SCP-6690 is a recurring phenomenon affecting actors portraying the titular character Barney the Purple Dinosaur of the children's television program Barney and Friends. SCP-6690 manifests by continuously placing the target actor at an elevated risk of death and or injury due to unforeseen and excessive accidents. Thus far, no deaths have resulted from the SCP-6690 phenomenon, although the exact reason for this remains unclear. The SCP-6690 phenomenon currently affects Carrie Stinson, the most recent actor to portray the character, and, to a lesser extent, David Joyner, who portrayed Barney from 1991 to 2001. Addendum 6691 While incidents involving the filming of television shows were not uncommon during the early to mid-1990s, the set of Barney and Friends note, which premiered on the public broadcasting service in January 1992, was abnormally prone to safety accidents and calls to emergency responders, nearly quadruple that of other programs at the time. While these incidents almost always involved injury to David Joyner, the previous costume actor of Barney, station foundation agents were unconvinced that this was the result of anomalous phenomenon and not coincidental. However, with the release of the second season of Barney and Friends, similar safety incidents involving David Joyner prompt official foundation intervention. A lock of incidents was maintained. A subsequent accident during onset filming became increasingly more common. The most notable of these was the following incident. Date, 5th of April, 1991. Episode, A Camping Me Will Go, Season 1. Episode 22. Note, the following occurred shortly after the Foundation began actively monitoring the set of Barney and Friends, and was the incident which later sparked the phenomenon's active investigation. Begin log. 11 minutes, 31 seconds. The scene depicts a wooded area with a blue tent sitting behind a cast towards the right edge of the perspective. In the middle sits a big campfire, with two wooden logs laying along the left and right side of the campfire's outer perimeter. The cast, excluding Barney, is sitting on the logs, facing the campfire. Barney stands upright in between the two logs, wearing a fisherman's hat and a beige vest. An unknown animal noise plays throughout the scene, scaring the cast. It's a bird called an owl. <laughs> what was that? Sounds like something's in the woods. <clears throat> that sounded closer. Do you think it's a bear? Well, it could be because... The tune of The Other Day I Met a Bear can be heard playing faintly. Barney begins turning left and right to face the different cast members. The camera pans outward to feel the entire scene. Barney chuckles as he swings his arms. Oh, the other 
other day. The camera continues panning outwards slowly. The sound of metal creaking can be heard faintly. I met a bear. Barney elevates his arms above his head. Shadows begin forming below the cast members despite an obvious lack of light on the set. A great big bear. Barney begins point downward behind his head. The cast raises their arms to their faces, imitating Barney. Suddenly, a bright white light is activated from above the camera view, illuminating the set and cast. After another moment, the light narrows as a black blur falls from above the perspective into the fake campfire between the cast members. The black blur crashes, revealing it to be a large stage light. Upon impact, the cast members scream, scurrying behind the fake logs. Meanwhile, Barney falls backward, rolling slightly as he impacts. The fake campfire is quickly set aflame, but later stomped out by a cameraman that runs on stage. The voiceover of Barney's singing cuts abruptly. The cameraman approaches Barney, who has since stood up and removed his costume head, referring David Joyner. The man appears to be irritated, with gashes on his left cheek and forehead, presumably caused by shattered glass that fragmented from the stage light. No wait, that's it! I'm done! Joyner begins to walk away as Kathy Parker, producer of Barney and Friends, approaches him. David, wait! We can handle this! The cast is evacuated off the set as more people begin to assist the previous cameraman with the cleanup. The seventh time this month, Kathy! I can't keep doing this! I'll talk with the crew. You'll talk with them? About what? Making armaments out of actors? Sir, we made sure that everything was rigged up properly. Oh, you did, did you? Well, good for you then! Because that's not what it looks like from under the collapsing set every day while I'm trying to act. Do you have any idea how freaking distracting it is to have to watch out for throwing props, scaffolding, and crew while trying to do my job? Additional people continue arriving on stage. Parker remains motionless, staring beyond the camera's view. Can't even properly light up a camping episode's dark scene. It's freaking unprofessional. The faint sound of a door slamming is picked up by the camera. The feed then cuts to black. End log. Final note. Joyner would later arrive back on set to continue filming episode 22. When interviewed, Joyner admitted that his outburst was uncalled for. Per his original statement, he would cite his affection for kids and the psychic premonition of playing the Barney character as his primary reasons for returning to the set. Forensic analysis of the area surrounding the fake campfire revealed the presence of sulfur and trace amounts of animal blood. Statements from eyewitnesses present during the incident also reported hearing strange noises coming from above the stage, which included laughing, murmuring, and faint cheering. The source of these noises and the reason for these strange substances' presence remains under investigation. Due to its sudden popularity, the Foundation was unable to cancel the Barney and Friends television series nor its later installment until late 2009. As the anomaly manifested more frequently, the Foundation would begin playing a critical role in the production and development of the early Barney franchise in order to monitor and contain SCP-6690. Addendum 6692. By the third season of Barney and Friends, Foundation agents have been sufficiently integrated into production to begin containment operations of the phenomenon. Study of SCP-6690 was ultimately inconclusive as filming continued. Results in information concerning the anomaly stagnated as the Barney character continued to become a popular figure in mainstream culture. It was during this time, after the second season premiere of Barney and Friends, when senior researcher Anthony Shackle 
He pulled his strange card he had received from an unknown number. Phone call log. Caller. Multiple unknown individuals. Operator. Dr. Anthony Shaco, Senior Researcher for SCP-6690. Note. Dr. Shaco received a call whilst eating dinner with his family. Attempts to trace the number were unsuccessful. Begin log. Dr. Shackle's cell phone rings. Hello? Who is this? Uh, what do you want? Sir, you called me. Right, uh, look, I'm a busy guy. You can't expect me to keep up with everything. I can do the job for you. What? How do you get this number? Uh, listen here, buddy. I got it from a good kid, okay? Note, since child actors for the PBS were frequently cycled between shows so that they could continue performing and acting, the possibility of one leaking a phone number is not implausible in these circumstances. But that's not the point. You're the foundation, right? You guys pick up the floats of the world and lock them away, right? I wouldn't put it quite... Well, I have some garbage I need dealt with. That's too much for even me to handle. Sir, we are not some kind of garbage collection company, V. You guys have been keeping an eye on the Barney set, right? Don't lie to me. I've seen you walking around this guy's as cameramen and stuff. Well, you're looking in the wrong spot. What do you mean? Come to 123 Sesame Street and watch the neighborhood. You'll see everything you need. And... What exactly are we looking for? And who are you? You want me to do everything for you? Want me to wipe your butt for you too? I thought this would be the one time I wouldn't have to deal with children. Let's watch the street and... Oh no, I can hear movement up top. The sound of metal scraping against metal can be heard. Who are you talking to? Everyone, get down here! No! Get out of my home! I tell you every time they are not my friends, and you are not welcome here! Several muffled thumping sounds can be heard. I call him talking to someone on the phone! This isn't very kind of you. You make Elmo very mad. Now Elmo has to do something mean, and Elmo hates being mean! No, please, help me good. Leave Slime alone! The phone call is disconnected. End log. Final note. All attempts made by Dr. Shackle to contact the number again were unsuccessful, resulting only in muffled grunts and moans before being terminated. Due to the number of restrictions placed on Dr. Shackle's number by the Foundation, the call was believed to be authentic rather than taken as what would otherwise be a prank. Addendum 6693 After the offense detailed in Addendum 6692, Foundation personnel authorized the dispatch of several child actors to the set of Sesame Street for reconnaissance and observation, while the actors reported no strange or unusual event on set besides the absence of Oscar the Grouch. Microphones planted on the children were able to record a series of conversations between them and several characters of the Sesame Street television show. Note, interviews of voice and public actors for the Sesame Street cast did not indicate that they were aware of any additional children on set during this time. Due to this, the possibility of additional anomalous phenomena is highly likely. For off filming, while off screen, each child was beckoned by a nearby Muppet to lean in and listen to them in a hushed tone. The Muppets then proceeded to sing a distorted version of the song I love you, you love me. The song typically sung at the end of Barney and Friends episodes. The singing loosely followed the proper lyrics for two to three verses before the Muppet continued singing the altered version. Recorded verses of interest to SCP-6690 have been included below. Contact Bert Target Abby Smith Message I hate you, you hate me. Let's go out and kill Barney with a shotgun blast. He's coming on the floor. No more purple dinosaur. Additional information. A pump action shotgun was later discovered in the dressing room of the Barney set. Indiscriminate thaumaturgic insignia of a red beet enveloped in blue flames have been inscribed on the weapon. 
contact the count target Adam Ornis message I hate you, you hate me. Let's go out and kill Barney with a one chop, two chop, three chops, four. Now there's no more dinosaur. Additional information. Hello, Honest was soon apprehended by Foundation security after charging David Joyner with an axe. He would later be submitted to the local hospital after falling unconscious upon capture, succumbing to a three-month coma. Otherwise, thaumaturgic markings similar to ones found previously were discovered on his body. Contact Grover Target Jax Kane Message I love you, love me, let's tie Barney to a tree. Last of his ribs in a hole through his brain, Barney's now a purple stain. Additional information A tree shaped state prop. Spontaneously combusted whilst filming Season 3, Episode 1 of Barney and Friends, resulting in Joyner receiving second-degree burns. Despite attempts to douse it with water, the fire did not extinguish for another three hours. The fire itself was conspicuously blue. Because of the Foundation's initial unawareness, the publication of these songs were largely effective. Within months, Iterations of these songs and others from the Barney and Friends television series became widespread, particularly among children and adolescents. Due to the anomalous attributes of the Sesame Street cast, all legacy puppets of the television series have been contained individually while not in use. While the Foundation's investigations into these puppets are still underway, their usefulness in this investigation has been deemed an immediate priority. Addendum 6694 By 1995, the increasing amount of SCP-6690 manifestations prompted Foundation personnel to employ David Joyner in showing his secrecy regarding the phenomenon. After several failed attempts to mitigate or de-escalate the anomaly, additional protection was provided for the Barney actor. By this time, attempts on Joyner's life increased to several dozen a month, frequently reaching the hundreds by the end of the year. This led to Joyner departing the row in 2001, and Foundation agent Kerry Stinson taking his place. Interrogations of the original Sesame Street cast were performed. While most of these were unsuccessful, one member did mention that other Muppets were possibly aware of the situation regarding Sesame Street and Barney. Because of this, investigations into the Muppet cast were approved, with the following interview being conducted. Interview Law Interviewed Scooter Interviewer Senior Researcher Anthony Shacko Begin Log Thank you for agreeing to speak with us, sir. Oh, there's no need to call me sir, just, uh, Scooter, please. Alright, sir, uh, that's what you prefer. Thank you. So, you just want to know about the uh, Barney plan, right? Yes, so, uh, what were the Sesame Street Muppets doing and why? Okay, well, uh, first you gotta understand something. Those Sesame Street guys are way different from us. They may be Muppets, but they aren't the Muppets. We would never do something like this. Well, most of us. I can't really speak for Pico when I say that. Dude's got some serious darkness inside him. Scooter visibly shudders and dazes at the wall for several seconds before quickly shaking his head and readjusting his glasses. But those freaks over at Sesame Street, they've dug their own grave. They went for the live fast and die young approach by choosing to aim their program at kids. What do you mean, what's wrong with kids? Kids are awful for a Muppet. Sure, they give a burst of nourishment when you do a little dance or sing a little song. I mean, look at Oscar the Grouch. Guy got such a burst in his first episode, his fur turned green. They have such a damn short attention span, which has only gotten worse a time. And you're constantly chasing that high until you become a menace. Why else would it be hard to be green? It's an addiction. Huh, but that doesn't explain what's going on with Barney. 
What exactly were they doing, and why? Oh, sorry, I thought it was obvious. Kids trust us, and they listen to what we have to say. That's why we gravitate to educational television. So you just tell a kid to knock over a light, and they'll do it. It's easy. But why Barney? To eliminate the competition. Why else? And you're saying they have to eliminate him? Just go to Chuggles. Of course not. Children will watch whatever comes on. It's not like Barney is hogging the market or anything. Oh. So, why exactly are they trying to take him out if they don't have to? I couldn't tell you, really. Like I said, those guys over on Sesame Street just sound like us. We've, uh... I also noticed some other strange things, magic symbols and weird items being left behind in certain places. Scooter vocalizes an information. Could you maybe tell us more about that? Are you talking about the mug everyone has on them? The one with the red furred monster and blue flames? Uh, something like that. Yeah, I know about it, but my information is scarce. It's like everyone from Sesame Street went to sleep one day, and there it was. They all have it. Interesting. Does anyone in particular stick out to you? Uh, definitely Big Bird, the Cookie Monster, and Snuggle Puckers do too. The real popular ones, really. I noticed you didn't mention Elmo. What about him? What's his deal? He seems to be the one leading things around there. Scooter squints his eyes. What? Something wrong? No, it's just... Who's Elmo? And log. Item number. SCP-6595. Security level 4. Containment class neutralized. Special containment procedures. SCP-6595 is currently contained in commercial video vault J3 of the recorded media section of the Site 322 archives. The Jim Henson Company has been questioned regarding the creation of SCP-6595, but has insisted that they are not knowledgeable of it and currently deny liability. Waldo has been implanted into the Henson Company's online archive in order to search for instances of SCP-6595 and or items relating to its creation. Foundation Web Coring Team Alpha Cyan Joseph is to monitor video hosting platforms for references and uploads of SCP-6595. Users with a screen named Coffee Pals or iterations thereof are to be removed at first notice. Update 23rd of March 2014 SCP-6595 is considered neutralized. No containment procedures have been deemed necessary. Description SCP-6595 refers to advertisements innocuous to those created by Jim Henson for the now defunct Wilkins Coffee Company. The advertisements feature Wilkins, a yellow vaguely reptilian puppet, and Watkins, a red conical puppet with an orange spherical nose. The Wilkins Coffee advertisements aired between 1957 and 1961 in the Washington DC area. Each range between 10 to 15 seconds and followed a similar format. Wilkins will question Watkins regarding his preference for Wilkins coffee. Watkins would state that it dislikes the products, and Wilkins would harm, kill, and or cause the death of Watkins. The advertisement would then cut to a sun shot of a Wilkins coffee product. Some advertisements would have Wilkins threaten the collective viewership as well. SCP-6595 manifests on YouTube.com as Wilkins Coffee commercial compilations uploaded from the user Coffee Pals. Note, this user has also gone by the screen names C Zero Fee Pals, Caffeine Friends, Espresso Combates, and 
Freak you! Stop removing me! I like coffee! Among others. Attempts to terminate the channels that post SCP-6525 have previously succeeded. However, a new channel will be created once the previous is deleted. The first two to three minutes of SCP-6595 affected videos will be dedicated to previously aired advertisements before shifting to SCP-6595 instances. SCP-6595 instances will contain major alterations to subject matter, dialogue, costumes, and or backgrounds. Instances will instead focus on an aspect of the individual feeling them, including their personal troubles, places of employment, physical attributes, and family members, among others. Addendum 6595-1 Testing Law Test ID 6595-2 The Subject The SCP-6595 Research Team Result in Advertisement Both puppets are in frame. The entirety of Watkins shrouded under the white lab coat. The Foundation's logo is stitched on the right breast pocket. A large egg is poking out of the collar. Hey dear science guy, I heard you didn't like Wilkins coffee. I'm too busy for coffee. Two human hands quickly move into frame and violently grasp Watkins. The hands slam Watkins into the table with extreme force. The egg shatters and Watkins falls out of frame, groaning in pain. Wilkins keeps you from cracking under pressure. Footage cuts to a large can of Wilkins coffee. Test ID 6595-5 Subject D32451 Result in advertisement. Both puppets are in frame. Watkins is clothed in an orange jumpsuit reminiscent of a D-class in uniform. The SCP Foundation logo is hung against the backdrop. Shouldn't you be working? I don't feel like it. Why don't you have some Wilkins instant coffee? It'll pick you up. I hate coffee. Off screen, sounds of metal chains and alarms are heard. A large puppet of a nondescript monster servant comes in from the right and pursues Watkins. Watkins watches as the two puppets run back and forth. Things just seem to happen to people who don't drink Watkins. Watkins and the monster run off screen. Two seconds later, ripping and chewing are audible. Wilkins remains in the frame, however, it does not move. Footage cuts to three small cans of Wilkins instant coffee. Test ID 6595-7 Subject Guest Dr. Peter Duggan Resulting advertisement Both puppets are in frame. They are wearing Foundation uniforms. Both have large name tags clipped to them. Wilkins reads Director Log And Wilkins reads Duggan can you get me some of that Wilkins coffee? I'm feeling tired. No, that coffee stinks. That's no way to talk to the director. What are you going to do, fire me? From behind its back, Wilkins pulls out a lit match and throws it at Watkins, who immediately erupts into flames. This triggers the sprinkler system. Wilkins coffee sure does fire you up. Footage cut to a small plastic tube of Wilkins instant coffee. Addendum. 6595-2 Recovery of SCP-6595 Instances Waldo was initiated following Addendum 6595-1. A location in New York City, New York, was marked as the source location of the uploader. An investigation uncovered the location of origin to be the Jim Henson Studios archive, which was subsequently designated as a priority place of interest. In conjunction with the above discovery, research personnel reopened the SCP-6690 file. Senior researcher Anthony Shackle was assigned to the New York location to perform another interview with the members of the Muppet Show cast. Transcript Members Senior researcher Anthony Shackle Kermit the Frog Various members of the Muppet Show cast Begin now Thankful for meeting with me, Kermit. I know how busy you are. Two voices are heard loudly laughing in another room across the hallway, belonging to Statler and Mordoff. 
I'll pay off Muppet. He's something old men. They serve as hecklers during the Muppet Show. Come in launching insult at coming to frog of Fozzie Bear. Busy? Busy doing what? Boring the audience? <laughs> Come in to leer us at the closed door. What are you guys? Uh, where do you want to start, Mr. Shaco? I'm going to need you to think back for this one. Fifty, sixty years to be exact. We found some videos of two Muppets for a company called Wilkins Coffee. The name Wilkins and Watkins. Oh, jeez, you have no clue what those two Nimrods have been putting me through for 40 years. I'm a professional. I ran a show to the highest standard and work with professionals. Those two. The door of the interview room is suddenly opened. The Muppet Beaker, the assistant of Dr. Benson Honeydew, a scientist and inventor. Beaker is currently on the receiving end of slapstick-style punchlines, where Beaker is injured by Honeydew's inventions. It's seen with a pair of sunglasses on his face. The sunglasses have numerous wires sticking out of them, and the lenses have been replaced with solar panels. Kind of approaches the door. Slow down, Beaker. I can't understand you. <laughs> Suddenly, the sunglasses burst into flames. Beaker begins running back and forth through the hallway, meeping loudly as it does. Dr. Bunting Hillendew quickly approaches the doorway. Mr. Garment, I see Beaker already demonstrated my solar powered sunglasses. I think they're malfunctioning. Uh, quite the contrary. They seem a bit too effective in absorbing the sunlight. I don't have time for your science, Bumble Jumbo. I'm in the middle of an important meeting. Mr. Comet, this is a very important breakthrough. I'll break through this door and show you what's important. That's not possible, Mr. Comet. Why is that? Well, Mr. Comet, the door is up. Comet slams the door and returns to the table. That's a normal day around here. I assumed I loved the bits on the Muppet Show were script. You give us a bit too much credit if you think we made up everything on the show by ourselves. The only real scripting we did was when the film was cut and edited. Huh. Learn something new every day. Wilkins and Watkins, uh, what can you tell me about them? Uh, they're more of a ghost story than anything. Hansen got rid of them as soon as he could because they always give them a bad feeling. I was around. He was using me for some skit. But I never really saw them other than a passing glance. Are they still around? I'm as in the dark as you are on that. When's the last time you saw them? Uh, probably the middle of 61. That was when the Wilkins commercial contract ended. Never saw them after that. And Henson was hesitant to talk about them. Always said that we can't see them anymore. If it's all right for me to ask, Mr. Shackle, why are you asking about them? We've been noticing oddities that involve the two. There are online compilations of their ads. Most are normal, but some are a bit more out there, even for Henson's standard. What do you mean? The ads talk about the people watching them. I see, I see. Won't be the first time. What? Uh, nothing, nothing. Uh, do you have any more questions? Will they know that Wilkins Coffee is out of business? If they're still kicking in those internet videos, I doubt it. Did Henson say anything about them? Anything that would lead you to a location they might be at? Any hints? Hmm. All he said was, I didn't like Wilkins Coffee. End log. Following this interview, the Foundation was permitted to enter the Henson Library archives. Kermit allowed the recovery team access into a cordoned basement level where an open metal box of VHS tapes and film reels were found. This box is unlabeled, and the tapes are not documented in the archive's repository. Next to the box was a laptop, logged into the YouTube account, CoffeePals underscore 554, and multiple electrical cords soldered to the box. Red fur fibers found in the carpet and on the laptop, belonging to an unknown source. Kermit claimed that it was unaware that this was occurring within the Henson archive, and does not know who would be responsible. 
Addendum 6595-3 Testing log continues. After the foundation recovered the source tapes, all instances of SCP-6595 on YouTube.com ceased activity. Accounts under the Coffee Pals moniker have also since appearing following the deletion of the aforementioned Coffee Pals underscore 554. A number of differences were noticed when viewing the physical tapes and reels. Wilkins and Wonkins will now commonly directly address, threaten, or attempt to converse with the viewer. Test ID 6595-11 Subject Dr. Brandon Levers Instructed to rewind the advertisement at various intervals. He saw an advertisement. Both puppets are in frame. A little birdie. Dr. Evers rewinds. When the video resumes, Wilkins and Watkins dance around his surroundings in confusion. What was that? I think I have an idea. Should we keep... Dr. Evers rewinds. The video resumes, showing an empty set. The picture turns to static. After five seconds of silence, it cuts to a shot of Wilkins' face staring blankly into the lens. Heavy breathing is audible. Test ID 6595-12 Subject, Dr. Brendan Leavers Resonant advertisement. Wilkins is in frame with the company logo hanging behind it. Wilkins enters wearing a brown toupee and a lab coat. Hey there, SCP Foundation Dr. Brendan Nevers, Social Security Number Beep. Yes, I'm Brendan Nevers, Social Security Number Beep, and I like rewinding movies because my brain can't keep up. How do you know all about me? Same reason I know that your mother lives in Stapping Friends Nursing Home. She sure does live there. She also keeps her door unlocked despite warnings from me, her son. How do you know all this about me? Wilkins Coffee keeps your brain focused. Well, I hate coffee, and I hate Wilkins. Wait a minute now, an act of mine lets you remember a bunch of things, like your allergy to bees. Why would I? Puppets of bees warm Wilkins, who runs off to the right. Footage cut to a stack of Wilkins Coffee cans. The logo has been replaced with text reading, Leave us coffee, in a similar typeface. Test ID 6595-16 Subject, Dr. Nathan Fredericks Resulting advertisement Wilkins is in frame with the company logo hanging in the backdrop. It looks to the camera. Hi, Doc. You like Wilkins coffee? Are you talking to me? Yeah, silly. What you say to a hot steaming cup of Wilkins coffee? Can you see me? Of course I can. And I can see you don't have a nice cup of Wilkins. Wait, wait, uh, where's this being filmed? Who's making these? Buddy, I'm trying to ask you about Wilkins Coffee. Quit going off topic. I don't care about Wilkins Coffee. Please answer my. A large poster unfurls behind Wilkins. It depicts a photograph of a female child, identified as Dr. Frederick's daughter, with the word missing written above it. Things just seem to happen to people who don't drink Wilkins. Footage cuts to a white mug and a half-filled coffee pot emblazoned with the Wilkins coffee logo. Addendum 6595-3 Incident Log Test ID 6595-20 Subject Dr. Zero Locke Instructed to explain that Wilkins coffee no longer exists. Resultant Advertisement the two Muppets are in frame, with the Wilkins Coffee logo hanging on the stage curtains behind them. Wilkins looks into the camera. Hey, Thea, do you ever have a nice warm glass of Wilkins Coffee in the morning? My friend here thinks it's not all that. Can you hear me? Thought you science fellows already figured that out a few days ago. Yes, I have to make sure, and no, I haven't had Wilkins Coffee. And why's that? Not a coffee drinker, or do you just have no taste? I have to inform you, regretfully, that the Wilkins Coffee Company no longer exists. Sure it does, silly. I have a can right here. Wilkins walks out of frame, returning a few seconds later. The video quality is observed to degrade. We are out of cans. They're gone. What do you mean they're gone? They're not here. I don't know what to tell you. Wilkins paces out of frame, 
The Wilkins logo collapses, startling Wonkins. The tape cuts to a new scene. Wilkins and Wonkins are standing in front of a blank background. The curtain is missing, revealing the white sheet rock behind them. The stage is dimly lit. Hey there, do you drink Wilkins coffee? No, I hate Wilkins coffee. Me too. Subsequent testing has found that all footage will only display a video of Wilkins and Watkins silently staring into the screen, unmoving, and mouths agape. Object reclassified as neutralized.